Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1.30 p.m. session in the Business and Enterprise Track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific panel on the new era of content protection in OpenSim. Our panelists include Myron Curtis, who has been involved with the evolution of digital technology for many years. He still has his dad's TS-1000 home computer that he played games on as a child. He has taught computer science at Butt Community College for the past 12 years, has been building virtual worlds since 2006, and now owns Virtual Worlds Grid. John, a Pathfinder Lester, is a leader and expert in knowledge management, 3D simulations, multi-user virtual worlds, and immersive learning. His background is in neuroscience research and medical, medical education, and he previously worked at Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Linden Lab. John is currently the chief learning officer at Reaction Grid, and he's also the community developer and creative advisor at Wiggle Planet helping create free-range, self-animated artificial life at the intersection of augmented reality and the physical world. Elon Tochner is the co-founder and CEO of Kitely, the biggest commercial provider of OpenSim regions and the creator of Kitely Market, the leading marketplace serving the hypergrid metaverse. Elon formerly held key positions in several startups, including CEO at ID Choice and Director of Infrastructure Development at OmniSky. Elon has an MBA from Tel Aviv University and a degree in computer science from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. My name is Maria Korolov. I'm the editor and publisher of Hypergrid Business and of the Hyperica directory of Hypergrid Destinations, and I will be the moderator of today's panel. There have been a lot of changes this year in OpenSim when it comes to content protection. Previously, grids could only filter con content that was saved into OR files, and then this is a, a backup of the entire region. And this was only for closed grids that controlled all their own regions. For everything else, it was pretty much an all or nothing situation. If you were on a hypergrid, for example, or in an open grid, all content could in theory be exported uh, to any other, to, to most other grids, to people's local hard drives, etc. That is no longer the case. Grid owners now have a wide variety of alternatives for content protection. One option, which is not, as far as I know, used by anybody, is to use the new export permission that was created by Avenation and Singularity. It is now supported by most modern viewers. Another option initiated by the Kitely grid, and now used by other grids as well, is to only allow items that have certain permission to travel to other grids. For example, a grid might allow only full perm items to leave a grid. Uh, Elon, Kitely is the biggest grid that uses this kind of filtering. Can you tell us how this works? Uh, yeah, uh, let me begin by uh, discussing our philosophy. Um, we believe that if you want uh, the metaverse to grow, uh, we need to provide people with ways to legally move content from one virtual environment system to another. Uh, we believe that the copyright laws and content licenses should form a legal framework on top of which the metaverse is built. And we believe that virtual environments and marketplaces should contain tools that will help people make sure that they, the content they use uh, is used with, uh, within the defined confines of the license with which the content was acquired. Uh, practically speaking, uh, in open, open sim, this means that the permission system works as a type of license from for the sim tool. Uh, it is not without its faults, but it does convey the wishes of the content creators and it does help honest people avoid doing things which they aren't allowed to do with the content they acquire. There is a section in Kitely's term of service which details how uh, these permissions should be interpreted when the license isn't explicitly defined using other names. When it comes to content protection on the hypergrid, we believe that the existing permission system, that, that is copy, transfer, and modify, should be used to convey what the merchant intended regarding licensing. This is partially due to wishing to support the prevailing attitude towards content protection in open sim grids, and partially due to practical reasons. Adding a new ex export permission to the mix forces grid operators to decide what the default should be for the existing content of the hypergrid. 
Uh, this was intensely debated within the community before we developed a permission-based kind of export control system, and we didn't want to take sides as both options had valid arguments to support them. We ended up choosing to, uh, to rely on the following logic. If something if someone does allow uh, doesn't allow their content to be transferred to copy inside the grid where the content currently resides, then he surely doesn't uh, agree for the content to be moved to a system where this license may not be enforced. This results in ensuring that content that is saved to an OR file will have all the items uh, without both copy and transfer permissions filtered out, but while permitting all other content to be included in their OpenSIM archive. And when it came to content protection for the hypergrid, uh, we apply the same logic. Only items that have both copy and transfer permissions can be added to a person's MySuitkits inventory folder while the person is inside his or own uh, home grid. Similarly, only worn and attached content with copy and transfer permissions will be allowed to teleport out of uh, its own home grid. If the avatar has some, anything else attached, then that teleport attempt will be stopped and the avatar will be notified. Uh, we assume that other grids will apply their own content protection logic, for example, using full, uh, only have, allowing things with uh, full permission instead of just a copy and transfer logic that we use. Um, so um, we didn't enforce I and, I and deals on people acquiring content for the type avatars, based avatars when they're traveling to other grids. So you can take things without copy and transfer while in other grids, and the other grids copy protection uh, mechanism uh, to the enforcement. And that, however, is only part of how we handle content protection in Kaidi. We've spent the last two years developing Cartoon Market to serve as a metaverse marketplace, a marketplace which will deliver content to any accessible location on the hypergrid and to other open virtual world platforms, for example, high fidelity eventually. For us to, uh, to be able to implement our full plan for this marketplace, we needed a much more robust content management system that would allow us to do more than just indicate whether an item is exportable from Kaidi to other grids. I'm not really going to go into that uh, in this reply as I don't have time, but I will say that items sold by a country market do have an explicit export permission associated with them, and that this export permission is based on a system that is different from the one Avination and M Singularity team developed. Uh, all this is to say that while the copy transfer approach is used for items originating in the end world, items containing elements that were bought from Kaiki market use a different system to determine its part of the holding. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Elon, um, is it correct that the number of items that are exportable on the Kitely market has been growing over the over the past few months since you opened the, the, this feature? Uh, yes, uh, that is correct. Um, the number of items has been growing. The percentages of items sold with export permission is growing. The percentage of items bought that have export permission is growing. Uh, it's very clear that uh, hypergrid is driving adoption. Uh, in Kaikli market. Um, so it's not just uh, selling to Kaikli uh, avatars, it's, it's selling to the entire uh, open to metaverse. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, moving on to uh, John, uh, John Lester, or Pathfinder. You were one of the early pioneers of hypergrid travel with the Hypergrid Explorers Club, and your Blam gates are, are, are a st stable feature all over the hypergrid. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about um, how uh, virtual 3D content is treated on the web with, with licenses instead of digital rights management, and if this is something that uh, the virtual worlds can emulate as well? Oh, great, thanks. Um, yeah, if you look at the bigger world of how 3D content is created and sold across the internet. Um, it's very different than how it works within Second Life. I think a lot of people who, you know, cut their teeth on Second Life as, a th as you know, the first exposure to 3D content in general, um, people might assume that something like uh, digital rights management, you know, the DRM system of is this object copyable, transferable, modifiable, and so forth, um, exists everywhere. And the fact of the matter is it does not. If you look at, for example, um, uh, and I'll just paste the link into, into local chat, but if you look at sites like TurboSquid, which is arguably you know, one of, if not the largest clearinghouse for anybody who's a 3D content creator wanting to sell their 3D content for use in 
video games or, or advertising or video or whatever, um, it's all driven by licenses. And the licenses are very clear and they're very um, uh, visible when you purchase these items. And so when somebody buys something from TurboSquid, there is no, oh, I can't modify this. I can't open it up in Blender. You know, the, the larger culture at play here in terms of 3T content is this, um, it all comes down to the license. So I think, you know, I think that type of mentality is one that's important to keep in mind when thinking about how to evolve the systems that we have here in immersive multi-user 3D virtual worlds. Um, I'm not saying that getting rid of all uh, DRM type features is a good idea, but I am saying that it's important to remember that the the larger the larger view of all of this, the the way the rest of the world and most of the world works, is in um, it all comes down to the license. You take your your 3D model, you can do whatever you can do or not do with it is all codified in um, in law. So that's uh, that's that's my perspective on things. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, Myron. Um, one example of a grid that's not locking down content is Virtual Worlds Grid. Virtual Worlds Grid is the largest open sim grid by land area with the equivalent of almost 20,000 regions. Myron, can you talk about your grid's philosophy about content protection? Yeah, I'm going to play uh, devil's advocate here and um, basically ask if really if we should be involved in this at all. Um, we don't have the ownership of any of these products that people are building. We can't guarantee that they themselves are in uh, compliance with somebody else's copyright laws. A lot of our textures are harvested from the Internet, and those uh, all have copyrights attached to them that we may not be aware of. And uh, as a grid owner, I can go in and I can actually alter a database and change the creator name and the date that it was created on an object and say it's mine. And the only way anybody's going to be able to uh, to prove otherwise would be to require a forensic analysis of my hard drive using bit streaming. It's very expensive, very time consuming, and very difficult to do properly. So um, my philosophy is basically that the copyrights belong to the people who are building these things. If I'm somebody sues me, of course, I'm going to remove it. But um, I've even had things of my own in Second Life that people try to claim were theirs, uh, especially a picture that I took of my wife and my granddaughter splashing around in a mud puddle and turned into a meme. And I was able to prove that, no, it was mine. But um, this is going to be an issue that's going to cause us a lot of heartache. And if uh, we uh, let ourselves get pulled down this path, uh, we may actually be building a time bomb that's going to destroy our ability to actually grow because the legal system doesn't really understand what we're building. And if you do get sued, unfortunately, it's not necessarily in your legal department's best interest to win the case for you because if you win, everybody goes home. But if you lose, then all of a sudden there's compliance negotiations, fees to manage, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of billable hours for your legal department. So if you're going to be getting into this, you're going to try to protect other people's content without owning it. You had better have a very strong legal department with a very specific contract that prevents that from happening to you. Um, let's see, I lost my path here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. The other thing I'm is, right I really here, don't man. have the time. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> That's all right. You know, and the other thing, too, is I personally don't have the time and resources to do all this for my residents. And I really don't know very many grid owners who have that kind of money and time and staff. Uh, Virtual World's grid is me, myself, and I and my residents. Uh, and then there's other things going on that make this even more difficult. You mentioned OR files. Uh, if you take an OR file using 8.01, I think it is, the OpenSim version, and you load it up in a grid where the creator doesn't exist, it automatically ascribes the creator to whoever loaded it up. So that's broken again. We don't have control over those things. So. Um, 
as an industry, we may have to proactively work with the legal system and legislative systems throughout the world and try to way to ensure that we're not being, you know, um, taking down a path that's actually going to prevent us from growing. There, we're creating a whole new world in a lot of ways, and we're really going to have to have the world come along with us and help us make sure we can do it right. Uh, Myron, don't the safe harbor, harbor laws of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act address some of those concerns? They do. Uh, as you mentioned to me at one point in time, they're not necessarily free, but uh, they are a form of insurance that we probably do want everybody to look at. But at the same time, they're incomplete. There's, uh, for example, Creative Commons. A lot of people think that if they take something and change it by 20%, they're in compliance with Creative Commons. They can sell it whatever they want, and they really don't understand what that is. And they don't understand that Creative Commons only applies to certain groups and certain types of content and how it's distributed. So um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there that I don't have the resources or even the knowledge to, uh, to manage myself. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that this is probably a community project, but not necessarily uh, the responsibility of each individual grid owner. Mm. Uh, in the, the general industry, such as uh, music industry or the movies, um, uh, Amazon and uh, the iTunes tune stores, there seems to be a movement away from digital R DRM of locking down these things. Um, and uh, towards uh, more usability. So if somebody buys something, they can make a local copy of it, make a backup for themselves or share with a friend because if they really wanted to, they could go out and illegally download it anyway by right. making it inexpensive and convenient and easier to use. Um, a DRM-free co free content is actually more competitive in the market. Um, uh, John, would you like to address that? Yeah, I mean, that's something that sure. um, Steve Jobs is famous for realizing really early on that as soon as you know he started down the road of positioning Apple as a company to provide um, music content to people, he, he realized very early on that you know the, the, the horse is out of the barn. At best, DRM is is friction. It's never a barrier, and you know, at best, it tries to keep honest people honest. But a lot of times, it ends up adding more complexity to people trying to do legitimate things to things that they actually do own and have paid for. Um, so it's you know, it's the trick is to make it much more compelling and easy for people to buy what they want. That's how to win. You know, it's 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 about creating an opportunity for people to pay content creators for things that they have value that have that have value for them. And and I think it's also really about allowing content creators to um, explore opportunities for, uh, for more business models than the you know the ancient stone age. You know, I have this goat skin. Will you trade me that piece of meat for this goat skin? And then there's a transaction of things back and forth. You know, there's there are newer models for content creators, like um, having people be parts be part of you know subscription services and getting different types of maybe early access to certain types of content that other people don't have. I think there are just so many opportunities out there for people to do exactly what you know Apple did with the you know with iTunes becoming a you know for the most part um, um, a system for making it really easy for people to get content without it being encumbered by a lot of of uh, DRM cruft. <laughs> um, a few years ago, uh, when I first started writing about OpenSIM, there was a widespread perception that it was a haven for copy botters. Uh, recently, I've noticed that. Uh, most of the grids, freebie stores, are actually offering legal content from Linda Kelly, from OpenSim Creations, uh, from uh, and from their own local designers. Um, it is is OpenSim starting to take content uh, protection seriously? Is this something that you're seeing um, in the, the hypergrid as well? And anyone who wants to take uh that. 
I'd, I'd like to jump on that first and just say um, the amount of, and I have to be totally honest, the amount of what's obviously ripped content. And I don't like the term copybot because the copybot is only for people who understand the history of what's happened in Second Life. But it's very common for people to run software to rip 3D models from video games. There are entire multiple large websites dedicated to people ripping, you know, the latest models of, of, of different characters and different video games. And, and, and by models, I mean not just characters, but also all the assets, the buildings, everything. And to be honest, I see a lot more of that in Second Life than I do in OpenSim anywhere across mm-hmm. the hypergrid that I explore. If you go to the marketplace, you see tons of content that, yeah, that's the model from Bioshock Infinite. Yeah, that's this model from that game. That's the model from Half-Life 2. And, you know, for Linden, in Linden Lab's defense, you know, they do end up pretty much taking that stuff down pretty quickly, but just as quickly as they take it down, it's like crabgrass. It just pops up again. Um, and overall, I would say across, where I look at things across the hypergrid, um, you know, occasionally you'll see ripped content, but a lot of, t- more often than not, it's people who are, are, uh, are building things on their own. And, um, or people who have had very clear intentions about how their content could expand beyond Second Life. So, for example, with, um, um, uh, you know, some people who create content in Second Life and then say, oh, I'm going to upload it to OpenSim and I'm going to put a Creative Commons license on it, you know, like, like um, uh, Arcadia Asylum, you know, mm-hmm. um, in Second Life, who has tons of content in OpenSim, you know, all of her urban grunge taxi models and buildings are all over se- se- uh, Second Life for free in the store, as well as all, all across OpenSim, because she's explicitly made her intentions clear about it being, um, uh, you know, her stuff is free to distribute all that she she wants is to make sure people don't, you know, just sell it and try to make a profit off of, you know, the direct assets that she's created. So I think Ian is really on, onto something about uh, figuring out ways to codify intention of content creators. And, and that's really what licenses are. Licenses are codified intention, codified in text and in legally binding situations. Um, so I think that's um, that's the trick is to figure out what, you know, give the content creators more power to make their intents well known. I always thought it would be really, I thought I, I always thought it would have been really good in Second Life to have metadata attached to all content where content creators could put in some way of saying like, this is Creative Commons license, so you should be able to take it out of Second Life or use it, you know, in other ways uh, beyond this particular platform. Uh, Elon, now, uh, Kitely Market is the closest thing we have to, like an iTunes for OpenSim. Um, can you talk about how um, it enables creators to, for, you know, express their intentions for how the content will be used? Um, yes. So, uh, in Kitely Market, um, as I mentioned in my uh, initial uh, reply, um, we have uh, explicit uh export exportability uh, flag, um, which is quite different from uh, the Avi Nation's uh, singularity, uh, um, I'd call it uh, philosophy, that the only things that are full permission should be exportable um, uh, and then uh, explicitly. Um, we, and, and, and it's not uh, done via in-world uh, permissions, as those um, may not fully reflect the intentions of the content creator. A person might want to sell something with full permission in his own grid, but not want that thing to be removable to other places, uh, while still wanting to have other items that might be even just uh, um, transfer without even copy or modify be exportable. So uh, in Kitey Market, uh, we have this uh, explicit export, uh, I'll call it uh, flag, uh, even though it's a lot more complicated than that, um, which controls uh, what can be done with e- each of the bot items. And we track that um, once it's uh, res inside Kitely, so no matter whether you uh, duplicate the item, assuming you can, uh, res it, transfer it to other people, and so forth, we still know uh, each uh, where each item originated from, the actual transaction it was bought from Kitely Market. So if there are issues, we can actually, uh, uh, some of this is a component and some not, but we track all the information to actually lock down the content. Uh, and in particular, um, called pedigree of the content that's arrived from Kitey Market. 
Um, now, getting to, to your question about, I want to say something about the question about uh, uh, digital right management and uh, copy botting uh, and, and uh, on gen open system in general. I think a lot of the issues is that uh, DRM, I, as the way I consider it, is basically uh, allowing the, an automated way for people to not have to think about uh, licenses and what licenses allow them to do, uh, but still use a licensed co co uh, content in as permissive way as that license would have allowed. So the, the copy transfer modified permissions we have in OpenSim pretty much do that. Of course, it can be worked around. There's hacks for anything. But it helps honest people keep within the confines of uh, the license they got the content from, they got the, they acquired the content with. Now, getting to a uh, copy button and so forth, when, when you get an, an item from an, uh, some grid, and this happened in several times and people who got content into Kitely, and they acquired something that the, they thought was, was completely legitimate, and they didn't know that someone else had acquired it uh, illegitimately. And the, way, the reason they were so confident is because it had the proper permissions and the place looked uh, legitimate and so forth. And um, I, the, the initial problem of, uh, of having someone else claim to content that he didn't or she didn't create is owned by them does not get solved by the DRM. What DRM helps you solve is that uh, when people are honest, it helps them remain honest. Now, in Kitely Market, we have various strategies to, to minimize the risk of people selling stolen items on Kitely Market. We have systems that help, um, help um, merchants specify um, what items can be removed from Kitely uh, without requiring them to uh, select other permissions so they can define whatever combination of co copy, modifier, and transfer that they want and still mark the item as either exportable or not exportable. We have systems that track things inside Kaiki to help us uh, um, basically uh, help enforce um, the, 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 the license that is defined by the DRM um, to the extent that, uh, to which we can. And we obviously have uh, various uh, DMCA provisions um, and tools to allow people to easily complain about stolen content if that happens. Surprisingly, that rarely happens. And, um, uh, and uh, we, we, started, uh, we started our public beta in March 27, 2011. I think we had three instances to date where someone complained that the content that they saw was not, uh, was not uh, didn't have the proper creator information, shouldn't be here, and so forth. They contacted us without even doing a DMCA. We contacted the, the person who uploaded the content, and they were very surprised. They, they didn't know they were doing anything wrong. They quickly took the content offline, and the problem was resolved uh, without having to go into complicated legal matters. Because I, think, I do think that uh, a lot of the OpenSIM users are honest people. I see it in growth in private market sales. Um, content that could be found, copy bought, it, if, if people are looking for it in OpenSIM, is bought on a daily basis in open Kitely market. So if you give people uh, the tools to, to acquire content legally and uh, make them convenient enough, and, and then, then people will do so. And, and so I, I really think that uh, this question about uh, uh, the perceptions about uh, the type of people who use OpenSIM being dishonest are, are, are really misguided. They were just uh, people who didn't have options to, and they didn't have uh, ways that they had, uh, I would call it, they didn't completely lack, but they had the fewer options than they uh, were required in order to get all the content that they wanted. So they got it from wherever they could, and then it was hard to determine whether the content was legitimate or not. Now that there are more leg uh, options to get the content that you could be, should be sure that is like legal, um, the, I think the, the percentage of people who are acquiring uh, content in op for OpenSIM based grids is growing. Well, I have some questions that have come in from the audience. Um, you, the three of you represent three very different sizes and kinds of grids. Are any of you interested in more robust solutions for content protection, such as, for example, uh, PKI infrastructure, it's uh, private key encryption, no, private key infrastructure right. to secure content from an authorized use, so kind of like heavy-duty du 
encrypted signatures on content so that is it, as content moves from grid to grid, the permissions are kind of baked into it on a hard level. Is that, would that something that you guys would be interested in or, or do you have um, other opinions about that? I can go ahead and answer that. This is Myron. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really have a choice. We're going to have to go that route if we're going to have a sustainable business model where people can actually sell real-world goods through virtual worlds as well as the virtual content we're building. Uh, that's going to be the next stage. We're building a whole new Internet, and that's a part of um, just about everything you download from the Internet now, and it's going to become a more important portion of it. John? Elon? Um, I would say the opposite. I would say that putting effort and time into figuring out how to add more robust DRM is a continually losing game. Just ask the Motion Picture Association of America or the Recording Industry Association of America. It's just impossible to do that. Things will be cracked. It would be much more, in my mind, in my opinion, be much more forward thinking to put that effort and money and resources into creating things like um, you know like like currently Mike Kitely, Kitely marketplace where you have this ability to give content creators more options on how they can distribute their content and make their intentions well known and, and if you want to put some teeth to things to prevent people from really um, uh, you know going wild with taking your content and stealing it then do uh, work with licensing and real-world existing laws around copyright that are really, I think, the only way you'll you'll really have any kind of teeth to you know preventing uh, serious uh, stealers of content from stealing things and and benefiting from them. Yeah, uh, I'd like to um, add my comment here as well. Um, I think that trying to prevent a content theft is 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 uh, it's really a losing battle. There's an analog hole that's built into the fact that we live in a world where content can be perceived using other digital media to to reacquire it. There's there's no way around that. Um, you can't lock up people's eyes, and people have cameras everywhere. So it's, it's things can be captured or copy bought it using the second life and far lines. Uh, with more or less ease. The, the thing that I think sh can be made uh, more convenient is allowing people who want to remain honest, give them the tools that will help them remain honest. As in looking at DRM, not as a way to try to enforce um, the, 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 the license in, uh, in the assumption that it's unbreakable because it won't be, but as a way that will help uh, people who are honest remain within the confines of the license that they acquired without having to constantly go and say, okay, this piece of what I want, can I do that with this piece and that piece? And that, that becomes too much of a hassle. If the system can automate that, then it makes using content from various sources together uh, in combination much more, uh, much more realistic. And I think that is how, how the internet works when things and uh, um, you mesh up various websites to create better and, uh, and more um, services that couldn't exist otherwise. And that's the same thing that happens inside the virtual world with uh, 3D content or so and, and so forth. So, so I, I would like to see a cross-platform way to codify uh, licenses. Uh, something probably more um, a bit uh, with a bit more flexibility than the existing system we've had in OpenSim, but that takes from the ideas that uh, that exist in the copy modify transfer system and add to them various things such as resale um, value and so forth, and something that allows you to um, basically automate that. Uh, could help, I think, uh, a lot of content creators uh, get content into the hands of consumers and otherwise have problems reaching. And this is really part of what we're aiming with Kite. As I mentioned, uh, the, the export flag is not so much of the flag as the feature of the content control system that we've built into Kite Market. Uh, so it's, it's really part of our long-term vision of doing that. Obviously, we're just at the beginning of, the, of this process, but that really is what we're aiming for. Um, Elon, can you talk a little bit about um, your uh, plans beyond OpenSim? Um, one, of, one of our audience members is asking about uh, your plans for High Fidelity, uh, Second Life, and other virtual platforms. 
Uh, and they also want to know if you're if you've considered supporting things like direct colada or or textures uh, sales or downloads that are not just OpenSim specific, but like more like uh, Turbo Squid. Um, Turbo Squid exists, and there are various other marketplaces like it. Um, the way we see uh, things moving forward, and again, I'm not, you know, if there's a business opportunity and it's big enough, we might pursue it. I'm not willing to get anything out. But the way we see our, our vision is that uh, currently TurboSquid is very convenient for content creators. You go, you find the license, you research it, you combine it with other things, you can open it in Blender and uh, 3D Max and so forth, uh, all great. Um, content creators well, are, are prosumers at best, professionals more likely. Um, they're, they're not consumers. As a consumer, you want to be able to go and when I click a shirt, have my avatar wear it wherever my avatar is on whatever system it is, whether it's OpenSim, High Fidelity, or any other system that we can integrate with. Um, and so if, and in some systems, that might look like an inventory, it's a folder-based inventory that we know from OpenSim Second Life. In other systems, it might look like a completely different user interface, and, and, and items might be grouped completely differently, not in so much as an inventory folder structure, as in the kind of a group. So you have your shirts, and you have your pants, and you have your so forth, and there's no, not a lot of flexibility in organizing items otherwise. And, and as a consumer, you just be, want to be able to go to a marketplace buy whatever you want and have it delivered, and not have to think about um, basically how the sausage is made. And with Tuber Squid and other places where you download the content, you, you have to be kind of the, uh, well, you have to be the butcher, <laughs> because you're, you're going to be combining and cutting the content up, and you have to make sure that you're, you're remaining within the confines of the, of the, of the um, licensing that you acquire the content with, and you, and you have to then go and integrate it into various systems. It might be as simple as just uploading into Unity uh, um, developer, um, but it's it's but that that simple thing is 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 very hard for the great majority of people. Uh, for them to have, for a metaverse to exist, it has to be a simple, simple, simple process where external tools are 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 not an issue. They don't have to think about file formats. They don't have to think about uh, the prim count. I'm sorry, triangle counts and what. Uh, uh, material effects, I'm using second life terminology here, exist, are used, and, and, and they, they just want to know that, uh, can I buy it for high fidelity? Checkbox, checkmark, yes, okay, buy, deliver, that's it, that's what I want. And that's how we're focusing, targeting Kaipi um, Market to be this very simple to use uh, integrated marketplace for the metaverse, cross-platform, not specific to OpenSim. And, and answering uh, and uploading content into Kaipi currently is done by uh, OpenSim, but there is uh, looking forward, you know, we, we there's eventually there'll be a, a browser-based viewer, and there are already uh, services online where you can upload Collada files and have them rendered in your viewer. There's no reason why we won't, we won't have uh, this type of functionality in the future. So it's, it's really about giving the content creators the tools that they need, the most convenient for them to get the content into the marketplace, and providing uh, a, a marketplace experience that's the most convenient for the consumer so they can buy the content and just work in whatever virtual environments they're using. Um, Elon, um, uh, OpenSim Creations recently went down because of uh, technology, some technology issues. And uh, I've used OpenSim Creations to distribute with content I've created that I wanted to give away for free. Is there any chance of Kitely stepping in and offering freebies on their marketplace so that if, say, I create a Hypergate, I can put it up on Kitely for anyone to use and download? Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll begin my, my answer with uh, uh, we, we may always uh, change, things may always change in the future, but the way we currently see it is that um, Kaipi, uh, there, there's two aspects to this actually. Um, content, there, there's, there's various types of content. There's content that anyone can create. Uh, you know, Instagram has shown that there's a lot of millions of people can take great photos, especially if they have good tools. Uh, so it's very hard to make money with photos now when you can get great, great photos for free in the public domain. Uh, so um, there's, there's a creep. If you're trying to build a marketplace that sells photos, 
uh, you're going to have a harder and harder time doing that. Um, and there are other types of content. Like for example, currently 3D content, especially scripted, costs a lot of money to develop. It takes a lot of time, and it's it's, it's a rare ability to to create something of value there. And um, the, those people should have a way to monetize and not have to compete for free. Uh, the problem with having freebies in the marketplace, in any marketplace, is it drives uh, costs, it, it drives prices down. Because one, eventually you'll get to the point where the free content is good enough for most people, and there that disincentivizes uh, the creation of additional good content by professionals, and that's that's a bad road to to, to walk down. Uh, and just looking at Spotify and uh, and um, Tyler Swift's decision to take our albums off it, uh, you can see that content creators, especially the ones that have no problem selling, the, the more the, the ones that people want to get their content. Do not like uh, competing with uh, free or almost free. Um, now there are uh, various ways that you could get content uh, monetized that allows for freebies to exist in the marketplace. Uh, because you talked about subscription services where a person pays a certain amount of dollars per month and gets certain types of content included in that subscription where they can use or as much as they want. There are types of ad-based uh, uh, content uh, where basically you do the same thing, but just the, the revenue you buy is, is the one generated from ads. There are various ways this could be done, but I don't think that the metaverse at the current stage, at the current level of adoption, um, has any alternative um, monetization option other than outright selling the content or price or licenses to, to use the content um, and and doing that in a way that is uh, convenient enough for for end users uh, uh, to use now looking at the uh, market specifically in freebies if you if we allow let's say freebies for free um, then uh, we drive prices down, we reduce the likelihood of uh, professional merchants listing, we, we hurt our own, uh, our own um, basically uh, uh, revenue stream which helps us continue to develop the market. Um, and it doesn't really help uh, so much users because freebie content can be found in many places. One of the things we provide is a service, the added value of the services the market provides is beyond the actual content that is delivered. It's part of the experience and the tool that we provide. And that costs money to develop, it costs money to run, and, and therefore we, we, we can't uh, basically make that free without hurting both our content creators and ourselves. Not a okay. tip, at least. All right, we, we have a couple of uh, uh, minutes left before we close up. Um, uh, John, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Oh, um, if I, I try to think of how to sum it up like in a sentence, it's about <laughs> codifying creator intent and conveying that intent. I think that's what it's all about. And I think that's a lot of what um, Elon is doing with Kitely is, is about that, you know, being able to codify what content creators want to do with their stuff and convey that intention to the people who are buying content. I think that's, that's the real use of, 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 of DRM technology in this case, in my opinion. Uh, Myron? Well, you know, pretty much to, to agree with their, everything that's been said so far, you know, nobody's wrong here. We're all right. It's just different viewpoints of the same elephant. We're like three blind men. We're each, uh, you know, describing our own side of the elephant. Um, I may have the rear end. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, I do want to urge people to be con conscientious. At the same time, I want them to be cautious about accepting responsibilities that they have no right or need to accept. Well, thank you, everybody, for a terrific presentation. And um, if you're looking to hear more from Elon Tochner. He has the next session in this track, Kitely Market, the Metaverse Marketplace, one year later at 2.30 p.m. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Thank you again to all our speakers and to our audience. We'll be back shortly with the next session. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thanks a lot.